Okay, let's start with our next in our series of the 27 pioneers. This is now number seven in our series. We're moving on to a gentleman by the name of Joshua Himes. We've covered uh, Miller and Bates and Stores and Byington and Pierce and Fitch, and now we want to look at Joshua Himes. Um, Joshua Himes was born in Rhode Island in 1805. He apprenticed at age 16 to a William Knights, who was a cabinet maker, but belonged to the Unitarian Church. And the apprenticeship lasted some four years. The record is, is that he attended church with Knight, Knights uh, at his Unitarian Church in New Bedford, but had a hard time with the Unitarian beliefs which actually, if you understand the teachings of Unitarianism, it actually does not accept the teachings of the New Testament, teachings of Jesus and his disciples. So then he started attending the first Christian church. Um, and by age 18, another example here of a young man who was uh, earnest and committed and involved, at age 18 he was baptized and licensed as an exhorter in the first Christian church. At age 20, the Massachusetts Con Conference of the Christian Church in New Bedford commissioned him as a self-supporting missionary. And as I understand it, this basically means here's a lay person who will not be on the salary of the church, but they want to do soul winning work. They want to work for souls, and we will commission them. We will officially recognize them as having that uh, calling and uh, acceptance by us. The next year, uh, 1826, at the age of 21, November, he married a Miss Mary Thompson Handy, and they eventually had nine boys. Uh, his quiver was full, as we say. Huh? Next year, at age 22, he's ordained. Uh, next year, at age 23, he moves to Plymouth, Massachusetts. The next year, 29, he moves to Fall River, Massachusetts. And then finally, these are sort of like every year there's something new happening in his life. At 1830, at the age of 25, He's called to the Boston, Massachusetts First Christian Church. Now, when he goes to that church, there are only seven families attending, which would be a fairly you know, small congregation. Um, if all families were intact, that means uh, there would be probably 14 adults and then whatever, whatever children were there. But the story is that he had the chapel filled in two years. Brother Himes was a reformer, and he espoused causes such as abolitionism, pacifism. You know what that is? It means um, we should not even bear arms and fight in, in the national conflicts. Education, uh, promoting education, uh, which in that time was um, not extensively uh, universal. and the cause also of temperance. He was too radical for some who wanted him to leave. So here's where, you, you know, you run with something so far, you, you run ahead of other people. And so he left, and he went to, um, he went in the year 1837. So this is now after he's been there for, what, seven years? He's 32 years old. He establishes the Chardon Street Christian Church. Actually, um, builds it, okay? As it says there, a number of the members uh, from the First Christian Church leave with him. They purchase property and build a Chardon Street Church, which would hold 500. It was soon filled and became famous as the site of some of the most radical reform conventions of the times. So this guy was a mover, you know, and a shaker. He was really uh, on the cutting edge, we would say, of, of, of uh, urgent reforms of the time. So just think of him as a reformer who had a lot of energy and drive. You'll understand where, where this life's going to go here shortly. 1839, two years later, December 18, and when he's 30, 34 years old, he has William Miller come and lecture at the Chardon Street. He had met him earlier in Exeter, New Hampshire, but he said, I want you to come and preach in my church. So Miller begins to lecture there. These were Miller's first lectures in a major city which tells you the first eight years of Miller's uh, public ministry, again, we, we said he started in 1831, right? This is December of 39, almost, you know, 
10 years later, or nine years, we should say. Um, apparently those eight years, he's been going to small villages, small churches here and there, small groups of people. This is the first lecture in a major city, and he gives a, a lecture twice a day. The interest was so great, hundreds had to be turned away. After Miller's lectures, Himes met with Miller and joined him as the, uh, in the cause as its prime mover, opening doors to other Christian churches in large cities and editing and publishing. F.D. Nichol described his method as action and on a large scale and without delay. So here's how they described that meeting he had with Miller. Miller has finished his lectures there at the, at the Chardon Street Church and they call it a chapel. And Heim sits down with him and says this way, do you really believe this doctrine? That's, why, why, why would um, you be asking that? Anyway, that uh, these two men are facing each other. The younger of the two, eagerly searching for a cause in which to spend his radical energy and remarkable talents, addressed the elder, an honest farmer and avid Bible student whose lectures on Christ soon coming were beginning to shake the world. I certainly do or I wouldn't preach it, Miller affirmed. Well then, urged Joshua Himes, what are you doing to spread it throughout the world? For eight years, Miller had been going mostly to small towns. He had done all he could and had no way to progress for any faster in spite of the urgency of the message. Well, charged Himes, if Christ is going to come in a few years, as you believe, no time should be lost in giving the church and the world warning in thunder tones to arouse them to prepare. What can an old farmer do? Miller defended himself and pled. No one as yet seems to enter into the object and spirit of my mission so as to render me aid. I have been looking for help. I want help. Then Father Miller challenged Himes excitedly, prepare for the campaign. The do for doors will be open in every city in the Union, and the warning shall go to the ends of the earth. So that's the type of man he was. And, as we can see, what began to happen? The next year, this was December we just read, right? 1840, age 35, he begins publishing the Signs of the Times periodical. March 20, in Boston. And on the CD-ROM, the first eight volumes of that Signs of the Times is all there. From 1840 right through 1845. So it's an amazing thing that we have uh, that on there. This uh, really was the, as I understand it, the main Millerite publication, getting out the views of what they were teaching, answering the objections of those who were criticizing what they were teaching, showing point by point the scriptural evidence for their understanding of the prophecies. In that periodical, he called for the first general conference of Adventists to be held, which turned out conducted in October of that same year. So things are happening fast. Now they start publishing this. Let's have a general conference. They get that organized. They have it October 14 and 15. And then the next year, he publishes the record of the conference, the first report of the General Conference of Christians expecting the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that entire record is also in the CD-ROM. If you'd like to just go through that and see the record of what they were talking about at that first general conference of, of Adventist believers. The next year, 1842, at the age of 37, he publishes Miller's Lectures. Remember our previous thing? We read about this gentleman by the name of Fitch reading through the lectures. Um, that was obviously the benefit of Joshua Himes publishing abilities. And as we note here in the handout, these lectures convinced both Joseph Bates and Charles Fitch of the Advent Message. So you can see how these, these things are interwoven. God was using these different people to promote things. That same year, he published two hymn collections. And we have the lyrics to both of those hymn collections on the CD-ROM as well. Here's what they're called. Millennial Harp, or the Second Advent Hymns, designed for meetings on the Second Coming of Christ. And along with Josiah Litch, um, Millennial Musings, a choice, of, a choice selection of hymns designed for the use of Second Advent meetings. However, it's interesting, as a editor, a publisher, before the first disappointment, which was the spring of 43, he had written the following. This is in his Signs of the Times, August 3, 1842. If we are mistaken in the time, and the world still goes on after 1843, 
Now, speaking of 43 there as being, again, the date on the chart, right? And they're thinking of the year 43, the Jewish year 43, as I understand him talking here. If the world still goes on after 1843, we shall have the satisfaction of having done our duty. Our publications are evangelical. They have and are now producing the most sal sal salutary effect upon the church and the world. Our lectures and public meetings produce the same glorious results. Can we ever regret that souls were converted, that the virgins were awakened and prepared to meet their Lord? If then we are mistaken about the time, what harm can result to the church or world? So he, he held out the possibility of that. Now, again, he's talking about the possibility of being mistaken on what? The time. Okay. And again, as we look later on, it will become clear that those who become our spiritual forefathers became convinced the time was correct. It was the event that they were mistaken on. Later the same uh, year, that was in, uh, I'm sorry, that was in, that was August. Um, that quote was from August. Actually, earlier, in May of that same year, at a conference of the believers, it was voted to schedule several camp meetings. So Miller had been traveling around holding meetings. These were not camp meetings. They, the, the Advent believers had not had camp meetings until 1842. And they said, let's start having camp meetings where we get people together and camp together, and we can really increase the exposure. So watch what happens. June, the very next month, June 28, the first camp meeting is held in East Kingston, New Hampshire. The attendance topped at 10 to 15,000, including a man by the name of John Greenleaf Whittier. Remember your American literature? Poet. At that meeting, they decided to purchase a large tent for future camp meetings. It was 120 feet in diameter. I left the word feet off, I'm sorry there, 120 feet in diameter. Its center pole was 55 feet tall, and it was said to be the largest tent in the country mm -hmm. at that time. And it seated some 4,000 people. And obviously, more would gather around the, the periphery. It was set up, it was actually purchased and set up in Concord, New Hampshire on July 27. See, they're not, they're not letting things sit, they're moving. <laughs> Every, you know, just a lot of things happening here. On July 27, it was, it was the first time. And another eight times by November 3. Okay, see, obviously you're not going to do tent, uh, tent pitching and camp meetings in fall and winter. They did actually enter into the fall if they, if they went clear to November 3, right? Probably getting a little bit cool. The estimate is that about 500,000 people attended 125 camp meetings between 1842, when they started doing this, and October of 44. Half a million people. Would you like to know what John Greenleaf Whittier thought of it? Here it is, right here, the next paragraph. In the signs of November 6, 1844, this is how he described it. To an imaginative mind, the scene was full of novel interest. The white circle of tents, the dim wooded wood arches, the upturned, eager, uh, the upturned earnest faces, the loud voices of the speakers burdened with the awful symbolic language of the Bible, the smoke from the fires rising like incense from forest altars, carrying one back to the days of primitive worship when the groves were God, God's first temples, ere man learned to hew the shaft and lay the arch, architrave and stretch the roof above it. Obviously from one of his own poems he's quoting there. Um, November 6, 1844, in the Signs of the Times, page 99. So, the impact of the Advent message was significant on all, all of the nation at that time. In November of the same year, uh, 1842, Himes felt we need to do more. So what does he do? He begins to publish the Midnight Cry periodical. What is this? This is a daily this is a daily, and it's published in New York, and 10,000 copies <laughs> are published each. And the, and the newsboys are selling them on the streets. 
and they're being distributed in other ways. And the first 26 issues are dailies, and then it goes to a weekly. This guy, as you can see, really has the means to get the word out. And he's, he's uh, the Lord's using him in a, in a powerful way. Look at what, how he describes it here in the first issue. Our work is one of unutterable magnitude. And again, let me, let me just interject this here. As you're reading this, ask yourself, is this still true? Do we as Seventh-day Adventists believe what this Adventist was writing right there uh, a few years before the 44? Um, obviously, the work has not been finished, right? Our work is one of unutterable magnitude. It is a mission and an enterprise unlike in some respects anything that has ever awakened the energies of man. It is not a subserviency to human institutions. It is not a conflict on a political arena. It is not the operation of a distinct religious sect. But it is an alarm, a cry, uttered by those who from among all Protestant sects, as watchmen standing upon the walls of the moral world, believe the world's crisis is come. And who, under the influence of this faith, are united in proclaiming to the world, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. It is an enterprise that swallows up all the petty peculiarities of sectarianism and unites us upon an elevation so far above those mercenary undulations that they are utterly lost to our view below. Does that still apply in some very significant ways? It is to be a ecumenical, true ecumenical movement, calling people out of all groups. And you can see why, coming from this background, later on, the Adventists who accepted the Third Angel's message had a hard time organizing. You know, this, this, we're, not, we're not here to set up another organization. This is a movement, you know. <laughs> we have a message to carry. We're going to get people from every place, every group, every church to join us. And so there's the danger. The danger is that we become institutionalized, no longer a movement. But they were led to organize because organization, again, who better than our friend Joshua Heim shows the benefit of organization, publishing, meetings, you know, all those types of things. They didn't have the other ministries like education and, and, and health things. But you can, again, you see the impetus here, the spirit, the urgency. I would say this has to come back or it will never be finished. Yes? I, I can see myself here because yes. when you look to the paper that I gave you, okay. um, I'm taking the statement that Sister Hawaii said, some who are alive today will see mm -hmm. this work fulfilled. I see. And I, I put it in 1917, so Mm -hmm. From 1917 to 2010 is 93. Mm -hmm. So those people are 93, 94. And if she said mm -hmm. they are going to be alive to witness mm -hmm. this prophecy mm -hmm. of Revelation 12, 17, that is giving me um, this... Uh, urgency. Urgency. Yeah. Yeah. There's, a, there's a lot of good reasons for urgency. Um, conditions in the world... Um, the the suffering that's going on, and the uh, the signs of the, the global situation developing, very much so. As the final Jewish year began, which would have been after the spring of forty three, he he made this note. This is April the twelfth of eighteen forty three in the Signs of the Times, uh, page forty four. As far as prophecy in connection with history presents evidence that may point to any particular time, it is our duty to consider it faithfully. Uh, obviously, they had a lot of time uh, elements on the chart, right? Many, many dates. So he says, as far as, as, as the prophecy um, may point to a particular time, it's our duty to consider it faithfully. But we have no right to be dogmatical respecting it. And we should consider how fallible we are and how liable we are to be deceived. We should therefore so live that we may be prepared for the earliest appearing of our Lord and yet 
Also, so manage our affairs in connection with the businesses, business of life that we may occupy till he come. So you see the balance there he has. Uh, be ready for the earliest appearing. But if for some reason we don't understand things fully, we also are living our lives so that we can occupy till he comes. So the spring of that year, they have the first disappointment. Um, and August, they are actually um, confronted with a, another Bible study, which we haven't considered yet. We'll look at one of our other biographical overviews. Uh, the Midnight Cry goes forth, which is the study of Matthew 25, pointing to the 10th day, the 7th, 7th month, October 22. And he accepts it. He accepts it in August of that year. And the way it's described by uh, one of our Adventist historians, A.W. Spaulding, when he and Mary returned from a summer trip, they found in, in the words of Spaulding, quote, the Adventist front aflame with the torches of the midnight cry. Remember, as Ellen White described the midnight cry, it was like a tidal wave that went across the land. Just an amazing moving of the Holy Spirit those months right before October 22. Um, she said, no movement has been as free from human imperfection since the days of the apostles, as was that movement of the, of the seventh month movement. Genuine moving of the Holy Spirit. Again, the Holy Spirit can genuinely be moving, and yet there can be a misunderstanding. Because Christ's own disciples show us that. They went out commissioned by Jesus. They healed the sick, cast out devils, preached the gospel. The message they proclaimed was true, but their understanding of it was not. So the Holy Spirit um, does not always guarantee infallibility of human understanding, and yet he can move, uh, use people uh, at their current level of understanding. In October, the great disappointment comes. Continuing then with uh, the life of Brother Himes here, um, the next year, April of 45, he joins the Albany Conference and he edits the Advent Herald, uh, another periodical. And just by way of explanation, the Albany Conference was the main body of Adventists that formed after the disappointment, which still believed that Jesus was soon to come, but that they should not try to set a date. The leaders formed this organization, the leaders that, that did form the organization included Miller, Himes, and Litch. Okay? We haven't considered uh, Litch yet. We've considered Fitch. Sometimes you get Fitch and Litch mixed up, but uh, Litch we'll be looking at later. Um, at least three other groups formed out of this post-disappointment uh, period of time. Those who abandoned their hope of the Advent, totally, gave up the faith, we would say. Those who continued setting new dates, and a small group who believed the date was correct, but the expected event was an error, though Christ was soon to come. And it's from the last group, this scattered flock, Ellen might call them. Then he belonged handful. to the last group. No, he belonged to the first group, the Albany Conference, the main group, the majority. Then he abandoned his hope? No, no. I said in addition to the first group, there were three other groups. Um, so the, he was not those that, he continued to believe that Christ was going to come, but they didn't try to set a date. From the last group who believed the date was correct, but the expected event was an error, the Seventh-day Adventist came. 1855, he joins the American Millennial Association, and that's because the Albany Conference split into the American Millennial Association and the Advent Christian Church, but then Eight years later, when he's 58, he joins the Advent Christian Church. So he actually has belonged to both of these groups that split out of the Albany Conference. But then, by 1875, at age 70, what does he do? He joins the Episcopal Church, which is interesting because when you look at his history, his parents were Episcopal. His parents were Episcopal. However, that's not the end of the story. Something very interesting happens. 20 years later, he's now 90 years old. He comes as a patient to a hospital, to a sanitarium in Michigan, at a place called Battle Creek. 
And he's the patient of none other than Dr. Daniel H. Kress. I've just recently been doing some study on his life. And he was a Baptist minister um, whose wife began keeping the Sabbath. <laughs> Sound familiar? We have some people that are still living that uh, were ministers whose wife joined, ministers of other churches whose wife joins, starts keeping the Sabbath and causes a problem. Um, an amazing story of how Daniel Kress finally accepted the Sabbath as well. And within a very short time, Dr. Kellogg sees the two of them. They're, they're, he and his wife, they already have two small girls. And he says, both of you need to take the medical course. And they, through providential arrangements, start the medical course. But that, and that, in those years, they were finishing up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is the University of Michigan. And they graduated in 1894. So this is the year after Dr. Kress, he's a brand new doctor, just out of medical school, working there back at the Battle Creek Sanitarium. And he stayed there until I think it was 98 or 99, he went to England, and then back to Australia, and then back to Tacoma Park. Spent most of his uh, time working in, uh, in the East Coast of the United States. Uh, there's, no, there's more history with him, but we, we don't want to <laughs> divert to another biography here. Um, our dear brother Himes comes to Battle Creek because he's ill, uh, and he has Dr. Kress as his doctor. And he conversed with Dr. Kress. And on his way back home with Jane Loughborough, who happened to be on the same train, okay? And he conversed with him regarding the history of the Advent movement. Do you want to know what he said to them? Here's what he said to them. This is what Himes said to Kress, in the words of Kress. God accomplished the purpose of the message he gave to us. And when our work was done, the Millerites, the Seventh-day Adventists were raised up to carry the work forward to completion in calling the people in all the world to move forward into the eternal land of promise. He said, basically, we were like, the Millerites were like Moses, who were, were, were not able to go on into the land. But then God raised up a Joshua to carry them in. We were like Moses, and you, Seventh-day Adventists, are like Joshua, that God has raised up to carry it on in. Wow. Amazing, huh? Um, what did he say to Loughborough? Well, here's what Loughborough relates. Of one thing he was thankful. He had never opposed the work of Mrs. E.G. White. That was doubtless with the remembrance of the fact that many of the First-day Adventists of the former movement had made that gift the special object of attack. Many of the, those who refused to accept the Third Angel's message really attacked Ellen White because her visions were sustaining the Third Angel's message, right? So he, he was happy that he had never opposed her work. But he never did that? No. He never kept the Seventh-day Sabbath that I'm aware of, um, but had fond memories of, uh, of his time working with the Millerites. And actually, when he we would hear the preaching, as I recall the story at the, at the sanitarium. This is like the preaching that I remember in the Advent movement of early years. Uh, there, some 50 years later there at Battle Creek. So it's an amazing, uh, amazing story. This gentleman, Joshua Himes, who the Lord used tremendously to accelerate the movement at that day, publishing, and his material is, is, is available. I, as I mentioned uh, down below, there's quite a few things available on the CD-ROM. The Midnight Cry, um, due to some interesting uh, situations, we did not include on the CD-ROM, but it is in part available online. And I give you the reference there under footnote number four. If you actually want to go and, I've been downloading them to my computer. Um, it, it's not as nice to search them because they're all individual files rather than putting them into a big collection like we've done with the others. But our goal is to include them with the next collection on, this, on the next edition of the CD-ROM so that we'll be able to have uh, all of this Advent uh, witness available even from the Millerite times as well. So, Brother Himes died actually that, later that same year, July 27, 1895, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Yes. You know, I didn't. I didn't uh, examine that mm -hmm. to to see whether she did. We could quickly glance at the. And then um, the Unitarians. Did they believe that the whole world was going to be saved? 
I believe the Unitarians have a universal view of salvation. So the question is about whether Ellen White made much comment about Himes. Let's go back to um, her collection here. In her entire collection, there is seven hits. <laughs> Not that many. Um, she actually, when she, this is actually a health reform vision. In volume three of Selected Messages, if you want to write these down, there's not that many I can give it to you. Um, th volume three of Selected Messages, 276. Uh, can also my sure. But it, basically, it was one of his publications that James White saw that um, information about health first mentioned in one of Heim's publications. So he continued publishing, okay? The next mention is again about the same, uh, the same thing that's in Testimony Studies on Diets and Foods, same incident. <coughs> um, Beg your pardon? Did you the testimonies, testimony Studies on Diets and Foods is called TSDF, and that's, um, that's actually in, this is interesting because there's no, oh, it's in the introduction to it, introduction before page nine. Um, this other reference from the Review and Herald is actually referring to the same thing. <laughs> my husband saw them in advertising a periodical called The Voice of the Prophets published by Elder J.B. Himes. Um, so you don't need that because it's the same reference as the other. Um, this is, this is very interesting. Um, she wrote a letter to him in 1895. That's the last year of his life. You want me to read? It's a very, very brief excerpt. This is in Volume 3, Manuscript Releases, page 256. Elder J.D. Himes, my brother in, Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus, I received your donation of $40. In the name of our Redeemer, I thank you. Be sure we shall invest this money in the best possible way to accomplish the most good for the salvation of souls. The spirited participation evidenced by your donation for this field has rejoiced my heart. By the way, where was she in 1895? She was in Australia. So he sends $40 to Australia to Ellen White after his time in Battle Creek, apparently. Okay? So that's, that's the field she's talking about. Um, the spirit of participation evidenced by your donation for this field has rejoiced my heart, for it testifies that you have not lost the missionary spirit which prompted you first to give yourself to the work and then to give your means to the Lord to proclaim the first and second angel's messages in their time and order to the world. So she, again, she credits him being involved with those first two of those messages, right? Not the third, but the first two. Very, very positive way that she's relating to him here. This is a great gratification to me, for it bears an honorable testimony that your heart is still in the work. Because he's contributing now to the third angel's message when he sends donation to her. I see the proof of your love to the Lord Jesus in your freewill offerings for this region beyond. She puts that in quotes. Again, I thank you for your generous contribution. Letter 31A, 1895. Interesting. So that's a hit number four. That means he was not against the Sabbath or the Sanctuary. That means he was willing to donate to the, to the movement that was teaching the Sabbath. The court, the court yes. In. yes. The, to some level, he believed in it, right. He, he, was, he was favorable toward it. Um, that actual, that reference actually had two places his name occurs, so that, that's numbers four and five. Um, the next one is a reminiscing about it. This is in volume 10 of manuscript releases, page 17. Uh, we feel deeply over Portland. This is, uh, I think this is Portland, Maine. We have not been here for many years. We were acquainted with Portland when the Great Advent Movement was going on in 1840 to 1843, when Father Miller, Elder Himes, and many of the leading important speakers were giving the testing message. So she's reminiscing after a visit to Portland, Maine. And then... <clears throat> um, 
The last one is a is a uncomfortable testimony. I remember reading this now, because apparently the man had his own problems with besetting sin. Do you want me to read this one? This is um, volume twenty one of manuscript releases, page three eighty. I assume that she's talking about him because. This is the only Himes that, that we know of. Uh, we, will, we will be clear to let such things be concealed and sins hidden with no real evidence. I'm um, asking a asking question. I apologize. Let me start off again. Will we be clear to let such things be concealed and sins hidden with no real evidence of repentance or reform? Your leaving California did not give you a new heart. She's writing this to a, men, a wayward minister um, by the name of... J.H. Wagner, who we've not looked at yet. You are out of sight of the infatuating influence of your adorable charmer, but, but this does not change the affections or impulses of the heart. So she's dealing with a minister who is attracted to a woman that's not his wife. Okay? Get the picture? And again, these letters let you really know how human these pioneers were and the issues that they dealt with. She says, after that statement, Elder Himes might have finished his course with joy had it not been for sensual practices, but he was led away of his own lust and enticed. The days and years which might have been his very best were his worst. So we don't know what happened in these later years of this man's life. 20 years after joining the Episcopal Church until he's 90 and he comes to Battle Creek because of health problems. Apparently she was shown some things about his life. Even though she's thanking him if this is the man that, that we're understanding it to be, she's thanking him for his willingness to contribute, his love for the Lord. But yet, his later years were marked with a sensuality that actually impacted his ability to be finish his course, as she said, with joy. And then she references the, the character of Solomon. Intellectual greatness combined with moral degradation mm -hmm. and the danger we have of, of that guarding against the flesh, no matter how, how, how much understanding of the truth you have. You, know, you still have to crucify the flesh with its, uh, with its uh, sins. So that's, that's what's there. And uh, didn't intend to end on that negative note, but again it shows um, how the Lord works through fallible human beings. In his, it's in, not a surprise that uh, many were lost because we know of... Um, Dr. Kellogg's, right. Jones, many, many lose their way when they take their eyes off of Jesus. Yeah. And even if, even if they're converted at last and are saved, they repent. What they've lost can never be fully made up. And we're, we're told that that's actually, I'm thinking of a specific statement later in, in context of the Minneapolis period. The two of the main opposers to Jones and Wagner then was, was Elder Smith and Elder Butler. She actually says that. Were these men to be converted and repent and be saved at last, their loss will be an eternal loss. They can never make up for, for the impact of their opposition to the message. But they did repent. Um, they did repent. I, I, f I find evidence that they repented to some degree, but they never really grasped the message and ran with it that I can see. Um, they, they were not lost to the cause, as Jones and Wagner themselves were, but that, that time was a very confusing time, a time where there was just a lot of things going on, and, and uh, God actually turned to these old men and they said, in essence, okay, you've, you've, you've caused the delay, now, now keep it from getting worse by telling what you've seen in the early days, you know. Re, re, recount the early days, reaffirm the foundations of, our, of the faith. But let's not forget, I'm, I, I think we would, would well close with what our Brother Fitch said, since he was promoting holiness of life, and we closed on an unholy thought there. He said, um, and I would think that Brother Himes would have the same attitude, my whole being cries out, come Lord Jesus, take thy great power and reign. I tremble in myself when I think of meeting him that trieth the reins of the heart. Now, that comment, trying the reins of the heart, yeah, what's that? that basically, the reins are the old term for kidneys. We get the word renal from the same root. But the reins of the heart, the kidneys were thought to be the place of, of, of motivation in, in your body. So what are, the, what are the motives of your heart? 
You know, you might live a holy, looks like a holy life on the outside, but what is the motivations of it? So Christ is going to try the motives of the heart, not just the actions of your of your person, but the motives of the heart. He says, I tremble when I think of meeting him who tries the reins of the heart. Still, I know that I love his appearing and feel a confidence in his mercy that he will not cast me out. So I believe that we can safely assume that at the end of Brother Heim's life, he cast himself on the mercy of God as well. Um, at least the evidence that points that direction. Any other thoughts about these people? What can we gather from Brother Himes? Are we as energetic and throwing our all into what God wants done right now? You know, Because individuals can make a difference, right? Human beings can make a difference. God can use your talents to multiply the effectiveness of how the message can go. And again, I say, I think it's going to take a similar commitment and passion. Our work is one of unutterable magnitude, he said. <laughs> it's going to take a similar passion to see the work finished. So may that day hasten. Amen.